So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Peter Knight. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good to be back here again. Thank you uh, for me having the chance to speak to you again today. Um, I've speak, spoken about Earth Mysteries in the past, and um, my work, as you know, and my books have been to do with ley lines and um, Earth energies and dowsing and sacred sites. And, and over 20 years in uh, studying those sites, inevitably, I went into churches because a lot of churches are on pagan sites. They were put there to Christianize them. And in going inside the churches to douse them, um, I started looking at the stained glass windows and uh, I think I, I started seeing to, thinking to myself, well, I recognize this. I recognize this image from somewhere else because I'd been to Egypt and all that sort of thing. So I started amassing all this, this information over 20 years and uh, eventually the time was right, I felt, now to, um, to, to bring it all out in, into the public because there'd been many fine books written before about symbolism. We probably all got them in our house about sacred geometry and symbolism. And there's been books suggesting that um, things had been um, borrowed from old religions. I'm being very kind there. Um, um, like the Da Vinci Code and things like that. The true story hasn't always been out there. Uh, but I'm not aware anybody had, 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 uh, had produced a book before about just telling that story of how um, Christianity absorbed the old religions and a lot of its myths as well uh, from, uh, from the previous religions, uh, how Christianity did this. And I'm not having a knock at Christianity in particular. Um, if I was forming a new religion today for whatever reason, um, I would look around what's already around, what floats people's boat, what, what energy, symbols are energetically powerful, and I would bring those into my religion to help tell my story. So um, it's a natural thing, really, and also you're giving people who you are seeking to convert images they already recognize and already associate with, so it all makes sense, really. And that's what happened uh, just this side of 2,000 years ago. So there is a difference between a sign and a symbol. Signs are designed to be understood in a split second like a road sign. Um, they are instructions, advice, or warnings, whereas symbols, on the other hand, may be embellished with endless meanings and interpretations, often beyond the grasp of the logical mind. They are archetypes. I was talking to somebody on the stall earlier on. The same images tend to come up in different societies, ancient societies, who supposedly never met each other. Uh, the same gods are developed to fill that little niche in their pantheon. So you have, uh, it's a rose by any other name. You'll get these gods all over the world that have different names from cultures who never met each other, yet the god does the same, or the goddess does the same, the same role. Oh, it's... I pressed it, but it's not moving on. Okay. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, so the earliest symbolism, of course, is nature's symbolism. Um, and our earliest ancestors were, were, were spotting the sacred geometry and the sacred mathematics um, in, uh, in all of nature, like the, the Fibonacci sequence in this, in the, in the nautilus shell there. And of course, uh, bee, beehives are always six, um, sided walls and uh, we've got the Fibonacci sequence here again spiraling both ways so people were observing this from the earliest times and they were they were they were thinking this is relevant who is the creator behind this surely all this can't be coincidence there must be some divine force driving this nature um, what they see these na natural manifestations um, and I've got a project I'm doing on Dartmoor at the moment called Mindscapes. It's about looking at natural objects and seeing simulacra everywhere and uh, seeing these as relevant to ancient cultures. And um, all these are natural um, shapes. The top right there is called elephant dolmen on Sardinia. And you can see, can you all see that? It's the shape of an elephant. It's completely natural. But what happened, Bronze Age people came along and they did a tomb underneath. See the holes there. This is called El Fungi, fungal, fungus rock, mushroom rock on Sardinia. Can you see me there, right at the bottom? I'm crouched like a, a gnome under a toadstool there. And uh, this is about 30 feet high. I would love to see the frying pan that this fits into. 
And um, the point is, of course, in Neolithic and Bronze Age times, they were taking hallucinogens, as, as tribal cultures do today, and a lot of them are mushrooms. So clearly, a rock like this would have been held in great cultural significance in ancient times. And of course, we've all seen tree spirits. We've all seen shapes in trees and rocks and clouds that seem to resemble something. And of course, symbolism goes back a long way. Uh, the Venuses, there are hundreds of these around Europe. The early cave paintings, of course, the Ice Age cave paintings, people are doing sympathetic magic. They are uh, drawing images of the um, creatures that they wish to hunt, connected with the spirit, so the animal will give up itself during the hunt. And of course, uh, Neolithic places all over have spirals in them. Um, so, so symbolism in pictorial form goes back a long way. And of course, symbolism predates writing. Um, people were doing symbols long before writing came along with humanity. Uh, it's a bit like a child. You put, you put a, a pencil or a crayon in a young child's hand and they will be able to do a design long years before they can write. And it was the same with humanity. People were expressing their spirituality in symbols because they're universal. It's a bit like music. Yeah, we can all play a piece of music and it can relate to all of us regardless of, of what language you are. So regardless of what race you are. Um, when I did the CERN giant book, I was looking at hill figures and I realized that sometimes the whole landscape can be a medium, can be a canvas for symbolism. Um, and it was once said, the landscape is an open book onto which memories can be emblazoned. And of course, there's the interesting concept that of course, it's the landscape that possesses the memories, that possesses the folklore. And we, when we move in to occupy a landscape, um, the landscape is gifting us uh, the wisdom and the knowledge. So it's the land that possesses the wisdom. We merely tune into it. So there's the white horse of Offington there, the top one, which of course we now think is a dragon. One of the best places to see it from is Dragon Hill. There's a clue. And um, so it's not a horse at all. And of course I did the book on the Cern Abbas Giant. I think we can all agree that's male symbolism. Anybody have an issue with that? No? Okay. Um, this one always gets a titter when I do a, a talk for the WI. Not quite sure why. Um, so um, every image I'm showing you today is in the book. The 600 images in the book, and um, I'm, I'm going to use them today. Um, there's a whole chapter in the book called Cometh the Cross. And um, it, it tells how Christianity came across Europe and um, gradually absorbed ancient and universal symbols to promote its own agenda. As I said, I would do the same thing. There's some differences, though, in the new religion and the old one. In the new one, Jesus is just reborn once, of course. He's just born once. Whereas the sun gods who were replaced were born every year. It's the annual solar cycle. But for me, the biggest change in the new religion to the old one is the denigration and even the denial of the divine feminine. That is the big difference. And I'm not having a go at, at um, Christianity. All the other religions are fairly patriarchal as well, I think we can agree. Um, the earth as divinity was denied. And um, I don't think humanity has recovered since that and especially women have not recovered since the divine feminine was denied. So that's another difference, uh, Christianity and the, and the older religions, but the divine feminine is there still, as I'll come back to later. Um, a New God in Town is a section where I look at how when, the, when Christianity swept across Europe, or I should say staggered across Europe, um, it, uh, how it took over existing pagan places. So in other words, people can still come to their ancient site, but now there's a new God in town. You know, it helps conversion much easier. And of course, the Knights Templars also found that when you put a, a church or a, you know, one of their sites on an ancient site, it's picking up on the energies as well. So there's an energetic reason as well. Uh, the top right one is La Hogue B on Jersey. There's a Neolithic tomb with a Norman church on the top. This is Knowlton in Dorset, a Neolithic henge with a Norman church inside. And this one's interesting. I found this one on Portugal at Anta del Parva. It's right in the middle of the village. It's the Amphalus of the village. This is a dolmen. You all know what a dolmen looks like. The capstone is just behind there, and they put a chapel right inside the dolmen. So it's still the Amphalus of the village. It's the central spiritual place of the village. But as I say, now there's a new god in town. 
So uh, a lot of you might know, of course, about the turning year, uh, how a lot of the calendrical events that we have today, a lot of the festivals and saints' days uh, are on former uh, pagan events and lots of festivals. Uh, Hall you know, Samhain was turned into Halloween, etc. Uh, pilgrimages are often calendrical-based, based on former pagan events. Uh, Easter and Christmas are interesting. I'm going to come back to Christmas later, but uh, for anybody who hasn't looked at their diary for next year, when's Easter going to be next year? Ah, we always know when Christmas is going to be, don't we? But when are you going to get your Easter egg? This is the burning issue, I think, really. Um, and of course, Easter is, is the first Sunday after the first full moon, after equinox. That's how Easter is defined every year. It's based on the moon. So you get things like this, which give us clues how um, everything is usually has an older origin than you think. Um, I, I can't possibly go through every category uh, of, of design and emblem we find in a church. Um, so I'm just going to pick some key ones today. Um, and I thought one that I'd do is the Tree of Life and the first people. It's about, uh, we, we know about the Tree of Life, of course, with Adam and Eve. But the Tree of Life is a very ancient symbol. The Tree of Life, the Axis Mundi, is this pillar, this conceptual pillar, this tree that links the underworld with the world of men to the world of the gods up above. It's, it's almost universal in its, in its existence. This is an Egyptian one that we're worshipping the tree of life there. This is one we found on, um, on Malta. And this is a tree of life I found in a Neolithic tomb in Brittany. And this is a Babylonian Assyrian one showing these two hairy dudes uh, worshipping their sacred tree. It's giving them their link to the divine realms. So of course this major image had to be brought into Christianity and of course it is with the cross and also the, uh, the pillars that we see. This is the famous apprentice pillar in Roslyn Chapel which goes around like the double helix of, a, of a, the DNA spiral and it's coming out of the mouths of dragons representing the earth energies. And the cross is interesting as well. It didn't take me long to realize where the cross came from. I mean, the cross is an ancient sun symbol, which I'll come back to later. But um, almost, uh, we're almost, well, we are sure that uh, when crucifixion happened, uh, people were crucified on a saltair cross like that. You know, the crucified man would be stretched out like that. And, um, of, of course, by, by putting the cross that way, now it's representing the tree of life. And, of course, now the only way through heavenly realms is through Jesus, who's on the cross Nice bit of spin, isn't it, really? And um, if you think that's all hokum, uh, this, these letters on this Christian window at Corsham actually say Arba Vita, which is tree of life. So Christians acknowledge this as the tree of life. But of course, the only way of eternal life now is through, is through Jesus. And this is a greater window. It's even living. The tree is living. And I think that's really, really poignant. So uh, another aspect I want to talk about today is the green lord or lady, the fertility of the land. Uh, nearly all ancient cultures have the idea of a green man or his equivalent. This is Geb, the Egyptian god, uh, the, the earth, one of the earth gods of the Egyptians, nearly always shown as green. This is Osiris, of course, very much associated with the fertile fertility of the Nile, the Nile flooding, his phallus goes into the Nile and fertilizes the land. And Osiris, if you look at some of the original paintings that have still got the color on, he's usually green. He's the Egyptian green man. And some of you might be aware of Green Tara. You can get uh, images of her around Glastonbury. She's the green fertility aspect and also the heart aspect of Hinduism. And even Islam has this uh, hairy Merlin type dude called al Qadir, which means the green one. And he hangs out in the woods and he's kind of a hermit character. He always uh, rides or has a dead fish in his hand. So I don't know whether he had many friends, really. I don't know that, I don't know that you would, really. But um, this idea of this green um, and often male fertilizing uh, principle of the land um, is, is very ancient. And of course, it had to be brought into the church. So now in the form of the green man, when you bring the, the green man in the, into the church, it's now not Sununus or Pan who's blessing the fields, it's now God, singular, by bringing an image into the church that everybody recognizes. All the people you are looking to convert know all about the green lord of the forest. Some of these are stunning, aren't they? Just look at this. This is clearly, these aren't whimsies, these are done at great expense by skilled Christian masons. And um, to me, when I look at the green man, it's the very soul of nature that returns my gaze. 
the land lives. And I, I constantly seek out the green lord and the lady in tree trunks, but also in churches. This is the famous one at Roslyn, of course, that towers over you when you're in the lady chapel. So again, they brought the lord of the forest into the church to depower him, really, I guess. Um, related to that, of course, is the phallus. Um, I wrote about that uh, in, the, in the CERN giant book. It, I call it the staff of life, it seemed appropriate. It's about the yang fertilizing principle of nature. And without getting on too much of a soapbox, the yang principle of, of, of nature tends to often be put down a bit in Glastonbury. Everything's feminine, fluffy, female goddess, female goddess. No, when I look around nature, there's as much yang in nature as there is yin. You have to have the two together. The god and goddess have to come together. You see it in every aspect of nature. Um, got the goddess is as much yang as she is yin. Off my soapbox. So in all the uh, prehistoric cultures, you get fertility gods where the phallus is on display. Obscenity isn't an ancient concept. It doesn't exist. In the Bible, King David danced naked before the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, obscenity is different from morality and nudity. The two are different things. So, um, you know, nothing wrong with nudity and showing the phallus in ancient times. Um, we have some large phalluses around Europe. <laughs> this is me standing at the ba base of the Dol Menur in Brittany. There's no, um, you know, no doubt what this represents. And there's another three meters of the phallus penetrating the earth. That's the point. When you look at a phallic stone, is it reaching up to the sky or is it penetrating the earth mother? There's two ways of looking at a phallic shaped stone. And uh, this is even, in, in nearly every um, chambered tomb I've been in, there's one phallic-shaped stone. This is the one in West Kennet Longbow, and we're finding this principle all over, and nobody notices them. You have to have, in the womb tomb, you have to have that male principle present. And again, I talk about that in the, in the West Kennet book. Um, you're going to think I'm obsessed with phalluses by the end of this tour, but uh, the, the, these are all, all these images here are just a few from the book. Uh, these were all done not as whimsies, they're all done by skilled masons at great expense um, uh, of phalluses around. That's a British one, that's a French one, a Spanish one. So originally, I think these represented the yang regenerative power of nature. Only later, were they, were they, rather than have them destroyed, they changed their meaning to remind us of the sins of the flesh. Uh, but it always seemed a bit strange for me. If you're trying to get people, you know, not to have sex, even in marriage, sex is regulated. If you're trying to um, get people not to do something, why do you put images of that all on the outside of your church? We don't want you to do this, so we're going to put these images all over the churches. You know, if I'm holding a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't put up a free bar in the corner and say, help yourself. Why aren't the pictures of angels and Jesus and that all over the building? It's because originally they meant something else. Back in the Templar times, they were representing the male uh, principle of nature, which the Templars knew all about. I beg your pardon, did I just skip one there? Yes, there we go. So of course, complementing the phallus is the divine yoni, that through which everything in nature issues. And uh, some good examples here, St. Necton's Glen in Cornwall, the great yoni through which the amniotic fluid of the goddess pours out. Um, this is a cave near Bristol that I do shamanic workshops in a few times a year. The divine yoni there is uh, there for all to see. And this is one at Avery. This is an original structure at Avery, not to do with weathering. And uh, the, the phallic-shaped shadow from the obelisk used to penetrate the yoni every belte in the fertility festival, complete with clitoris above, which has been worn by people touching it and rubbing it over thousands of years. You're welcome to partake in this ancient ritual, if you wish. So um, the divine yoni is an ancient concept. And uh, I'm working with uh, granite yonis, if you like, at the, at the moment. We're finding these on Dartmoor. This stone called the Tolman Stone has druidic folklore. Uh, it's dealt with in my novel, 13 Moons. The he hero takes all his clothes off and plunges through this one meter wide hole into the river below as an initiation. And uh, I think Caroline Hillier takes her groups to here as well, her women's workshops, and it has druidic folklore. So it's all about rebirth, rebirth through the divine yoni. Um, and of course, we have them in Christian carvings in the form of Sheelina gigs. Some of you have no doubt heard or seen them. I mean, one of the greatest, um, you know, um, strongest Catholic countries 
in, in the world is Ireland, isn't it? You couldn't think of a more Christian country than Ireland, and yet there's more Sheelina gigs in Ireland than anywhere else. So clearly a lot of folklore has gone on to ensure the survival, and because they realize what this originally meant, it's all about fertility. This is a French one here, why aren't we surprised? Um, this is the famous one in Kilpeck. Uh, very alien-like, isn't it, this? And these aren't hidden away. This one at Kilpeck is right above the front door. Everybody who goes in is meant to see it. And um, this is the famous one done by the Templars, we think, at Royston Cave. This is the shield in a gig right next to the sword, Excalibur, the shaft, the yin, the yang, the male, the female. It's all in balance next to each other. Um, the next image I want to show you uh, is what's called the areola or the mandola or the nimbus. You might have noticed in a lot of churches you often get Jesus or God, the main character surrounded by this glowing almond shape. Again, it's the yoni of the earth mother. It's the balance of yin and yang. Uh, and it's an ancient concept. This is a... This is a Hindu one, uh, sorry, a, a Buddhist one. Uh, this is uh, Helios, the sun god, Greek god. And uh, this is, of course, Buddha, and his nimbus is in the shape of a lotus leaf. It's a bit like when a school teacher uh, might write something on the blackboard, and uh, he puts a, a circle around it to emphasize it. This is what's being done here. It's showing that these are really major characters. And... Um, the, 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 the symbol of, and I say that, that carries on into Christianity. Um, you wouldn't have th thought there's a more Christian symbol than a halo, would you? You can't go into church anywhere and see the saints or Jesus or Mary without a halo on, but it has a much ancient origin. I think originally it came, comes from this, the sun discs that were over the head of the Egyptian gods and goddesses. Uh, this is a Greek one, a little bit more recent. There's the halo, and this is a Hittite one. Uh, all these predate Christianity by centuries and centuries. And of course, uh, Buddha is often shown with a halo. This is one in Edinburgh, Universe, uh, Edinburgh Museum. It represents somebody's purity. It represents enlightenment, that circle of enlightenment around you. I could fool you perhaps to say this is an early Roman depiction of Jesus. There's the halo around him, but it isn't. It's a Roman depiction of Apollo. There's the sun disk. So, of course, there was no way that Jesus could not have a halo because this guy is replacing the other guys. So to put him on an equal footing, Jesus is the new God. Um, the idea of the flood. Um, I dare say you've had a few talks about Atlantis here over the years. Uh, where is it? Where was it? Did it exist? The idea of flood is universal. It occurs in Hindu folklore, Babylonian, right across the world. There are concepts where God, for whatever reason, usually because we're not living to natural laws anymore, wipes the slate clean. And there's usually some hero that saves the day. And again, Noah is the latest version. This is, uh, this is uh, the, the hero in Babylonian myths. Uh, as everything drowns, he's in his boat and he's sailing away. And uh, in the uh, Hindu uh, flood myth, Vishnu, the god, actually changes himself into a huge fish to guide people to land. So the idea of the flood predates Christianity by thousands of years. Um, there's a whole section in the book about animals. Any animal or bird you'll possibly see in Christian uh, mythology or um, in, a, in a symbol in a church is in there. But I thought I'd just pick two today. Uh, one is the serpent, the other one's the dragon. Uh, two mythical creatures, but I don't think they're mythical at all. I think dragons and, and serpents are all around us. They represent the life force, the kundalini of the earth energies that fly across, the, that go across the, the, the land. Dows as many years found that the energies are doing this. They're not going in a straight line. Sorry, they're not. And um, the rainbow serpent is a, is a good example of that. That goes right through Glastonbury, of course, in the form of the St. Michael line. This is an Aztec uh, symbol. This is Quetzalcoatl in the British Museum. Two heads, male, female, yin, yang, solar, Luna. This is the famous Minoan snake goddess uh, from the Mediterranean. Two serpents, male, female, yin, yang, all in balance. Um, this is the famous rainbow serpent. This is an Aboriginal drawing from uh, Australia. And uh, some of you might have been to the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. This is several hundred meters long, done by the Native Americans. Represents the energies that go across the land. And uh, right at this end, he's actually disgorging or he's swallowing the cosmic egg. So this is the balance of male and female again as a universal balancing concept. 
so this course had to, the idea of a serpent uh, is brought in, as, as, a, as a positive force, is brought into Christianity. The symbol of St. Luke. St. Luke is the, is the patron saint of nurses, doctors, hospitals, healing. And he comes straight out of Greek and Roman mythology about Asclepius. He's the Roman god of Greek healing, hospitals, and all that sort of thing straight away and the serpents there's the two serpents representing the balance of male and female natural and science and uh, this is this is um asclepius he's only got one serpent and i thought this is really peculiar but when i delved into it more carefully the other serpent is asclepius himself because when he used to do healing he used to change himself into a serpent so there's the the second serpent as you can see everything is usually older than you think including me um, so serpents um, in the form of Hermes or Mercury's serpents show us what the energies are doing this this is a church where I, I found the energies the two spirals were going around in front of the altar I move the carpet back and there's two serpents under the on the, on the monuments uh, this is in the church at Crediton if you follow the Michael and Mary current across out of Cornwall into Devon the Michael and Mary current will meet in Crediton and there are no other serpents in the inside of the whole of the church except under the tower where the Michael and Mary current are crossing and here are two serpents what a coincidence I asked myself which of course it isn't um, the other concept that's almost universal right across the world is the idea of dragons. Um, very ancient, I, do, I, I, deal, I deal with dragons quite a lot in the book. I've just got time to show you a couple here. Uh, this is a Greek, uh, a legless dragon. I don't mean he's been in the pub, but he's a, he's a water dragon. And of course the Chinese uh, are very strong on the dragon. There's even a year of the dragon. Anybody born in the year of the dragon here? Oh, just one. Oh, oh there's a few, they're not so shy now. Yes. Magical. I've got a real, um, yeah, if you ask Sue, my partner, about dragons, we've got a toy, uh, a selection of soft toys uh, of dragons which keep appearing and <laughs> getting bigger, my collection. Oh, well. Uh, and even the, um, the Chinese and Japanese believe that when there's an eclipse of the sun, it's because a dragon is trying to eat the sun. And they all go outside and they bang cymbals and drums to frighten the dragon away. And it always works. <laughs> so why wouldn't they carry on doing it? And of course, dragons are brought into Christi Christian symbolism. St. George, of course, slaying the dragon. St. Michael slaying the dragon. And of course, the dragon now, rather than be the, the, the wise um, holder of wisdom uh, and, and buried treasure, which is wisdom as well, uh, he now represents paganism. So he's something to be smited, something to be downtrodden. So the poor old dragon gets a bad lot in the Bible on, on the whole. Uh, but it's a very ancient concept, the idea of a dragon slayer. Look at this. 1500 BC, there's a dude chasing a dragon. Same as this. And um, of course, she's, she's uh, Tiamat, the dragon queen. And it's the first example I know of patriarchy having a real fisticuffs with matriarchy. So this is one of the first signs I know where the goddess is trying to be, because of course, um, society is gradually now getting more patriarchal right across the world. Um, I deal with a few characters in the Bible. One of the ones I want to deal with now is one that I actually think existed, Moses. I think he was a Bronze Age shaman, a magician. Everything he does says this guy is a shaman. He goes off on vision quests, spends time on his own. He does what I can only describe as magic. Um, I, I, I liken him to the, the appearance of a, a British druid here. And uh, this is Moses doing his impression of Charlton Heston. Doing it rather good, actually, I think. So in Egyptian texts, we have, text, we have two characters, Tuthmosis and Tutmosis. There's the element of Moses. Some researchers think it's the same guy. It's just a translation problem uh, issue. And uh, in both of these tales, Moses is found, this Tutmosis is found in the reeds by his mother, bought, by his foster mother, brought up in the royal household and either becomes a priest or a prince. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? And... Um, I think this is where it, it comes from. And, uh, it, and at some stage in both of those tales, it gets banished from Egypt. So this all sounds very familiar, doesn't it? So, um, so I started looking into Moses. And um, he went up to Mount Sinai, do you remember? And he found the tablets. And um, it, a very peculiar passage in the Bible says that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he had horns. 
And I'm thinking, what on earth is this all about? Because, you know, horns are usually for the devil and Satan and all little uh, pixies and nuisance things that Christianity wouldn't like. But then there's a, there's a, I quote several passages in the book from this uh, American academic who's now retranslating all the Bible and telling us what it should really say which is really interesting. And uh, it said the translation should really be, Moses is giving off horn-like rays. So, of course, some you know, um, monk translating all this back in the second, third, fourth centuries wouldn't possibly know about the word aura. So I think he's come down from Mount Sinai in such a state of bliss, he's glowing. They can see his aura. They can see his connection to the divine through his highest chakra. So again, it's all in the eye of the um, translation very often. They say something's lost in translation, and uh, the Bible is a, an incredible um, example of that. So the Ten Commandments, right? Moses went up to Mount Sinai, came down with the Ten Commandments given to him by God. Did he? Okay. This is from the Egyptian Book of the Dead in the same time that they've dated Moses. This is said at funerals on behalf of the dead. I have done no falsehood, I have not robbed, I have not committed perjury, I have not killed. He sounds a really boring guy, this, doesn't he? Um, um, this is where the Ten Commandments came from. Sure, Moses was given them, given them to him by God, but I would suggest an Egyptian God. You know, this, this Moses was born up, was brought up from a small child, immersed in the Egyptian mysteries. So, of course, he needed some rules for his people. Um, and he came down from Mount Sinai with the word of God. But I would suggest he already knew them. He already knew them. They'd been known for centuries before he went up Mount Sinai. So uh, in a lot of... Um, a lot of gods have a magical stick. Here's Patath on the left, an Egyptian god. Even in, in fiction, Merlin, Gandalf, don't they? They have this magical staff where they go bump and the orc blows up before your eyes. Um, the idea of a magical Merlin, Gandalf figure with a staff is very ancient. Well, of course, Moses had one, didn't he? You know, he, he did several miracles with his long magical staff. And um, Moses in the Bible is taken to Mount Nebo after he lives to the right old age. A cave called Moses' Cave was excavated in 1839, and on it, they found a long staff with the words, Tuth Moses, on it. And I think, gold, that is gold. And anyway, this, this staff went from various private collections to a museum in America, eventually came back to Britain, and I tracked it down to, um, of all places, an exhibit in a museum in my hometown of Birmingham. Moses' magic staff, with the words Tut Moses on in hieroglyphics, is on, is on display in my hometown of Birmingham. So that was really quite cool, I thought. So this is why I think Moses did exist, for sure. So there's two aspects of the divine feminine, uh, sorry, of the, of the of divinity, usually the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And um, the divine feminine, usually the moon is, is feminine, not, not in all languages, I think. Is it German, the moon is masculine? Yeah. But usually, spiritually, the moon is usually seen as grandmother moon. And uh, Silver Hill is the pregnant tummy of the, the, the earth mother, we think. And lots of places around the Mediterranean are aligned with breast-shaped hills, the breasts of the goddess. That's the breasts of Aphrodite uh, at Mycetus. And um, one aspect of the divine feminine, of course, is the moon goddess. Again, in most cultures, regarded as feminine. This, this, this carving here is 35,000 BC. And there's a horn there, which has got 19 notches on, which is the number of lunations every year. Somebody worked that out 35,000 years ago. How cool is that? How cool is that? This is uh, the, uh, the Roman lunar goddess. Uh, from Bath, this is a Greek one, always usually a crescent moon associated with them, known as the Queen of Heaven in most ancient cultures, of course. But if, you, if you're going to bring this into Christianity, who is going to replace the Queen of Heaven? Well, the answer is simple. There she is. Even in some Catholic services today, the priest will call out, Hail Mary, the Queen of Heaven, and the congregation will repeat that. Um, and there she is, standing on the crescent moon. They say some things are hidden in plain sight. 
And uh, even the colours blue and white, we're, we're told by the church that blue and white is because of Mary's purity. Rubbish. It's because it's the colours of the, the waters and the colours of the moon. That's why she's in blue and white, in my humble opinion. But there it is. There's the moon goddess in plain sight. Um, the other aspect of the Divine Feminine, of course, is the Earth Mother Goddess. Here she is on a, a, an Eastern Mesopotamian carving. There's the Earth Mother with a solar sun sitting on her lap. Here's a Hittite one, the, solar, the, the um, Earth Mother with the solar sun sitting on her lap. This is a Maltese one. Um, again, we think that's the solar sun sitting on her lap. So I think you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Um, this is... This is uh, Egyptian, this is Isis, of course, suckling Horus, the solar god, on her lap. And even Krishna is often shown being suckled by his wet nurse, um, the idea of the new divine solar. So, of course, this image had to be brought into the church. The idea of, I mean, look at the love in that. The idea, it's a mother's love, isn't it, for her child. It's such a powerful symbol. It pulls on your heartstrings, and it's meant to, but it is so ancient. There's no way that this symbol could not be brought into Christianity. So the other aspect, of course, is the divine feminine. There's also the sun god. All the ancient cultures worship, worship the sun. They all realize how important it is for life on this planet. In my opinion, I think the sun god of the ancients was metamorphosed into Jesus. He took over the role of the sun gods of old as the new divine masculine solar deity. I've got a question for you. It's not a trick question. Trust me. Um, who was famously born on December the 25th to a virgin mother, died and rose three days later? It was the son. His name begins with J. Okay. Let's see if I was right. Jesus. Yes, of course, but hang on a second. It was a fiendishly quick, uh, sneaky question because all of these gods and several more I couldn't fit on the slide were all born on December the 25th to a virgin mother and were all involved in a resurrection, all of them. Um, from uh, Egypt, Rome, Rome, Greek, Babylonian, even the, far, the Middle East uh, and several more. So Jesus is not the reason for the season. Um, December the 25th is the first time when you can detect the day. The day is getting longer, and it's when the sun starts getting a little bit higher in the sky. It's halfway through the pagan festival uh, of, of winter solstice, which had to be Christianized. Everybody's having a party, yay, at that time of the day, the year. So there's no way you could eradicate that festival. So that's why Jesus is given December the 25th. And I spend two pages in the book discussing all the discussions that the early church fathers had, trying to make up their mind when Jesus was born. They hadn't got a clue. The dates range from October through to April. So they decided in the end on December the 25th because Jesus is replacing all the sun gods who are born on December the 25th. So I would do the same thing. It's very good. Um, so all of these, would you say that all of these, the, all these attributes and titles are all, all to do with Jesus, yeah? Yeah, walking on water, the Lamb of God, fisher of men, yeah, changing, changing water into wine, I'd like to do that one, that's a party trick, isn't it? So, uh, but actually, all of these titles and attributes I've taken from ancient gods, every one of them. So they are nothing to do with Jesus, but there again, they are all to do with Jesus, Um, this is an image I found of Apollo with his, with his flaming headdress. He's representing the sun going across the, tour, the, across the sky. And you'll find images like this. This one actually is just up the road, which is the reason I've shown this one. You can all go and have a visit. It. Look at it. He's replacing Apollo as the, as the solar god. No mystery. So, um, of course, Jesus is known as the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God, because he's the altruistic Christ who's sacrificing himself for his people, for humanity. And in the ancient temples, the lamb was usually the favorite animal of sacrifice. But I found several gods, uh, ancient gods, Greek, Roman, Babylonian, who've got a lamb on their shoulder. Uh, representing sacrifice. Several ancient gods that I list in the book are all known as the Lamb of God, the Lamb God, or the Divine Shepherd. So, of course, if Jesus is replacing those gods, he has to have a similar title. Um, look at the cross. Just take the cross, for instance. 
That's, uh, this is, um, these are both Bronze Age, I think, from Scandinavia. The cross is an ancient sun symbol. And look at this one. This guy is sporting a very nice crucifix. They really nice, that really sporty. But when you look at the date, 900 years before Jesus was born, the cross was being hung from solar god's necks. Um, Jesus the shaman, I think definitely. If Jesus existed, and there's a lot of people, researchers, who suggest, like Tim Freak, that perhaps he didn't exist, but God, I, did ho I do hope he existed, because the things that have been done in his name Please, I hope he existed. Um, and if he was a wise man, a shaman, a magician, a Gandalf, a Merlin, this is who the real Jesus is. And uh, he went on vision quests. He did lots of miracles. He walked on water, which six ancient gods also did, by the way. And uh, he did lots of miracles. Some of you might have been following the, um, the excavation, the underwater excavations in Alexandra Bay, where they think they found Cleopatra's temple. Ptolemaic temple. One of, the pot, one of the cups they found had this on, which has been translated as Jesus the magician. So even the early admirers and supporters of Jesus didn't regard him as the son of God. He's a great magician, a metaphysician. Um, it says it there in black and white. So did Jesus leave or not? To me, it doesn't matter. You know, did Merlin live? Did Gandalf live? Yeah, but you can still take the wisdom from those characters, whether they existed or not. Did the things in the Mabagodian exist? And all the other pagan stories, it doesn't matter. Take the wisdom from them and leave the hype. Whether, whether the, whether, whatever the answer, it does not devalue the message of love and compassion. This is how I see Jesus, a bit more like John the Baptist. You know, raggedy, he lived out in the desert, a real hippie dude, you know, who spent lots of time on his own. Uh, and of course, Jesus embodied the Christ consciousness, which every now and again comes back on this planet in a new human being. Um, so we've had the divine feminine, the divine masculine, but where the fun starts, I'm sure you'll agree, is when the masculine and the feminine get together. Oh yes. Um, and all the main gods and goddesses, especially the fertility ones, have a consort or a wife. They make love. They have to, don't they, for everything down here to exist. Everything that exists down here is a result of the procreation of the gods. So uh, that's the Naga of Hindu. That's uh, Enki making love in a Babylonian. Of course, we have the famous erotic carvings in India. And this is Hera and Jupiter. Uh, and it's all about the personification of nature. It's not to do with sex per se. It's all about the coming together of yin and yang so that everything can exist. So question, if Jesus took over the role of the sun god, so who's his consort? Well, of course, the answer is Mary Magdalene. It's Mary Magdalene. Of course, the Da Vinci Code came out years ago, and then all of it subsided, I think, because there wasn't enough evidence then. And... Um, but um, I think Jesus and Mary were carrying out the, the, the famous Heras Gammas. They were, they were a sacred marriage. They'd make love on the land. They are representing the perfect balance of yin and yang. Mary Magdalene is a, is a spiritual equal to Mary, uh, to Jesus. Uh, she'd have to be really, wouldn't she? They are equals. In the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, Jesus was proclaimed divine as the Son of God. He was never called the Son of God before that date. And it was a majority verdict as well, a majority decision. A lot of bishops at that meeting said, no, let's keep him as a prophet. As a, so, but from that date, of course, once you make somebody divine and the Son of God, he couldn't possibly be married or do all those icky, sicky things that man, that man and woman get up to. They have babies and things like that. No way. And that's why Mary Magdalene was demonized. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Mary Magdalene is a prostitute. Nowhere in the Bible. She's a woman with sin. But at the time the Bible was written, every woman was with sin. The Bible was written by men for men. That's the bottom line, really, unfortunately. Um, today is Mary Magdalene's day. Today, Mary Magdalene's day. So um, I want us to all humor me. And uh, on the count of three, we're all going to say, Hail Mary. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Hail Mary. Fabulous. Thinking of Mary as well, you know, the Michael and Mary current that go up the St. Michael line, the Mary current that comes through Glastonbury. Which Mary were they originally on about? Yeah? Yes, Mary Magdalene. So, um, Mary was the only one who was, who was qualified to anoint Jesus. 
At the wedding where we we turn water to wine, we're never told whose wedding it is. I know whose wedding it is. It was theirs. That's why we're not told whose wedding it is. Um, And uh, Mary is the only character ever, ever, ever shown at the foot of the cross. You get lots of characters around the cross, but only Mary is ever shown at the foot of the cross. And I found out that at the time of Roman crucifixions, only the wife of a condemned man could approach the cross. It's a bit like at the end of Spartacus. Do you remember? I'm Spartacus. Go on, somebody shout it out, doesn't it? Um, remember, that, remember they only allowed the wife and this newborn child to approach the cross? So there's a lot of truth in that. There she is shown with long blonde hair. That's usually how she's shown with an uncovered head to show she's a bit suspect. So um, Christ, of course, means the anointing one. Mary Magdalene is anointing her with her alabaster jar because she's a priestess of Isis. She's used to doing all these rituals. Anointing was a sacred marriage ritual carried out by Hebrews and Sumerians and a ritual carried out by Egyptian priestesses. I think Mary Magdalene was a priestess of Isis. That's who I think because we know Jesus went through down to Egypt. It's all those missing years out of the Bible. Where was he going? He was going to pagan mystery schools. That's why 15 years was taken out of the Bible. You couldn't possibly have Jesus going around the world to pagan sites obtaining his wisdom. Isn't it funny that we do, Jesus jumps from his teens to 31, is it? So... That's why. So that's probably where, and also the Black Madonnas. You know, it's generally accepted by a lot of um, a lot of people now that they are Mary. They are Mary Magdalene. And of course, I found out that a lot of the priestesses at the Temple of Isis were Nubian. They were black. So this is good. Was Jesus married to a black woman? So is it any wonder that Mary Magdalene was demonized? I'm hoping at the second coming, actually, that the clouds will open. And the Messiah will come down from the sky as a black lesbian woman. (laughs) Let's see the authority cope with that one, okay? So Mary misunderstood. Who's at the scene of the Passion? The only person visible at the scene of the Passion, all three scenes, is Mary Magdalene. When she goes to anoint Jesus, he's gone. She's there at the cross when Joseph of Arimathea takes Jesus and puts him in his tomb. Joseph of Arimathea no, had no problem with that because he knew the tomb would be empty in three days so he could have his tomb back. So, and of course, there's all the, the uh, le- legends to do with Joseph and Glastonbury. Who's the person that Jesus appears to out of all the disciples in the garden uh, after his resurrection? It's Mary Magdalene. And she even calls him in the Bible rabbi. In ancient times, and even it's, 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 it's uh, preferable now, rabbis have to be married. Okay, so even calling him rabbi is, a, is a, bit of a, a bit of a gem, actually. So, ladies, she's an archetype, isn't she? And for men too, I can relate to, to Mary Magdalene. She's a strong force in my life. This is the real Mary Magdalene. She's wise, she's sensuous, she's feisty. She's got a strength of character. She's wealthy and independent. We know that the two Marys finance Jesus' mission. She's a priestess. She lives life on the edge. All the things that the early church fathers hated women to be. That is why Mary Magdalene was demonized. But to me, the Mary Magdalene archetype can connect us to the land through conscious intent, as well as through physical union, the hearers gamas on the land, the ancient and and sacred life, whereas your love permeates out through the land. Uh, Arthur and Guinevere did it, you know? So uh, it's a very, uh, and I love this window. It's the only stained glass window I've ever seen with breasts on a woman. So um, they knew what they were doing with this window. So sometimes people try to expose what's wrong with you because they can't handle what's right with you. (laughs) And that's so true of uh, dear old Mary Magdalene. And I found several windows, some of them are in my novel. Uh, Several others I found since then are of Mary Magdalene with a very swollen tummy. We know it's her because she's resting her alabaster jar on her stomach. This is how the church shows her as Mary Magdalene. She's not Mary the mother. A lot of Mary Magdalene's have blue and white on. A lot of Mary the mothers are dressed in red. There's this interchange of colors. It's very confusing. It's so that they can hide things like this. Uh, the people who are in the know, the lovely people who are leaving us these messages. And of course, this is the famous one um, hidden by the modern uh, Freemasons up on the island of Moor. Look at this. Look at the love. 
between those people. Can you feel the love coming out of that window? Every time I look at this window, it opens my heart. And uh, she's even wearing what's called Magdalene Blue. And of course, it's the color of lapis lazuli. She was a priestess of Isis. That's why she's associated with that blue. These little code, I hate using the word code, but these little open secrets are there. And look at her tummy. She can't even get the, sh the, uh, the belt around her waist. It's so swollen. And then I found this, and even Lynn Picknett and others, some of the, the, um, the Mary Magdalene researchers weren't aware of this window. So if, if I've got a claim to fame, this might be it. Um, I was following the Michael Current um, across Cornwall, and I came to the Church of St. Neots, and I found this window. It's a scene of the crucifixion. And uh, next to it is a woman with a crown on, which is just a way of showing that she's important. It doesn't have to be a queen. She's got long blonde hair. There's only one character in stained glass windows that's ever shown with long blonde hair. That's Mary Magdalene. And she's holding a child up to Jesus at the crucifixion. I, my mouth, my jaw dropped when I saw this, because although some researchers think that, like in the Da Vinci Code, Mary Magdalene was pregnant at the time of the crucifixion, a lot of researchers, including Lynn Picknett, thinks she'd already had one baby. So uh, isn't that interesting? This is why the two names vary sometimes um, as to the child. John the Baptist hailed Jesus as the bridegroom. Was that a metaphor? I thought we were to supposed to take the Bible literally. Um, why would he call him the bridegroom? And in Matthew 9, 15, Jesus said to his disciples, because they were afraid, it was the day before he said, they're going to take me. He said, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? You know, what can that mean other than what it says? In the book of Revelations, when the second coming comes and the black lesbian woman comes out of the sky to save us all, it says in the book of Revelations, the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready for him. So it seems when he comes back, it's okay for Jesus to be married. William Blake, of course, the great mystic, in one of the lower words of Jerusalem, you know, the great song Jerusalem, one of the lower verses, it says, she walks upon our meadows green, the Lamb of God walks by her side, and in every children is, child is seen, children of Jesus and his bride. William Blake knew exactly what was going on and what had gone on. So, my last word on religion, I promise you. <laughs> um, shamans across the ages would surely echo with these sentiments. Religion is for people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for people who have already been there. <laughs> Can you relate to that? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, um, we started off with nature symbolism, and we've come full circle. I'm going to end with nature symbolism. I'm doing a project at the moment called Mark More Mindscapes. We're going around and finding these images, which are tens of thousands of years old, and the stone circles and the stone rows are lined up with them. Just like Native American and Aboriginal sites today, most of their sites are natural sites that resemble something. Um, these are the dragons. These are where all folklore comes from. The dragons and, and the giants of old, they're still on Dartmoor. And um, look at this one. Amazing. Nobody spotted, somebody had spotted before that there's a load of standing stones around that head, but nobody thought that head was relevant. What? So um, somebody once said, a legend is captured in the very outlines of the landscape, living books in which myths are inscribed. So we've come full circle to nature's landscape again. And there's me, I haven't just come out of the pub. We're, we're interacting with these stones. These stone faces have been there for centuries waiting for us to perceive them again. It's all about going out of your comfort zone. Because going out really means going within, for me. So uh, things like this. this, this rock is teetering. See this face? He's teetering, about to fall in. And yet there's a little altar down there and I've spent a lot of time sitting below there. And this face faces the summer solstice sunrise. So again, this was common knowledge thousands of years ago. And these images have been waiting your return. Please seek out nature's symbolism. It's the earliest. So in conclusion, what any symbol means depends on an individual's connection with it. And I would suggest also what space is, or in fact what a landscape is, depends on who is experiencing it and how. So um, please come and join me out on the landscape. We're sitting in caves and we're finding these huge stones, this bear overlooking us. We're looking down into rock, rock basins. 
you know, scrying the moon and the sun. Uh, we're hoping to, uh, you know, bring Dartmoor out into the wider community. So the book comes out, subliminal plug, you won't even know this has been on the screen, right? Um, that book comes out, I'm launching it at my Earth Mysteries conference, which is a very, very busy conference every year in October in Wiltshire. I've got flyers on my desk and uh, early bird price this weekend. And um, look at that five minutes, perfect. She's glaring at me. No, she's giving me a lovely smile, actually. Um, what I've been talking about, or hinting at, really, is that it's all about living in balance and harmony. It's an ancient ideal, but don't we need it right now? It's all about reclaiming our power, which I know Andy and others will talk about this weekend. It's time to wake up, I think, from a 2,000-year-old slumber. <laughs> I never know what people find funny about this slide. What is it? I think we've reached rock bottom as a species, you know, and uh, certainly in terms of environmental caring for the planet. This is a Native American site. Apparently, you shouldn't sit under there for too long. I'm not quite sure why. Um, <laughs> So what have we been up to the last 2,000 years? If you didn't laugh, you'd cry. I did a talk um, a few years ago at Megalithomania, a great program that Hugh runs. I know Hugh's talking this weekend. And at the end of the talk, uh, I finished early, which has never happened since. And um, one of the questions was, hey, Pete, what's your most special or most sacred place you've ever been to? And um, I'm standing here trying to think, knowing that all the audience are dying to go to the loo and have a cup of tea like you guys. And I think, is it Egypt? Is it the pyramids? Some American sites? Stonehenge? Newgrange? And then actually, I thought, yes, I'll answer that. The most sacred site I have ever been to in my life is this one. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? I say she, because even today, it's not Uncle Earth, is it, or Brother Earth. It's always Mother Earth. We know instinctively she's the one who births us and nurtures us. So we could take that, I think, today as a symbol of hope, of an ever-giving mother, of love. Her body is our wisdom in the land. The land lives. Seek out its spirit. Because I've been saying for a number of years, we are not fighting to save the planet. We couldn't kill the planet if we tried. We are fighting to see whether we're going to be around. Yeah? Nature, life will go on regardless. And um, because we are part of the Earth's spiritual evolution, I'm hoping she wants us around a bit long. But it's like in the film Avatar, you know, Pandora at the end, all the animals rise up to get rid of the humans. The planet didn't choose to do that for any other reason other than that was the only way to return equilibrium to the planet. So I think our mother has been very patient with us, so hopefully she will be a little bit longer. So I'm going to end up um, with some of the, the words from the last page of the book. The real power of symbols and myths is that they possess the ability to engage not only our mind, but perhaps also our heart, and hopefully even our very souls. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Knight.